Wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ken, and thank you, director, and everyone who's invited me. Water Brothers, thanks for being here. Appreciate you. But I really appreciate you for coming out in this. <laughs> and I'm hoping you'll appreciate me for coming out <laughs> in this. <laughs> uh, it, it was, what, 11 degrees when we got here? Or it's in, dropping steadily. I have the unbelievable pleasure of being someone who's worked with a lot of people. And sometimes you hear about the mega stars and the ultra professionals I've worked with but I've worked with an unbelievable number of young men and women and grown folks too who, whose names you'll never hear. You'll never hear about them. But in the book, you'll hear about all kinds of folks, peak performers from every walk of life. And one of the things I want to talk to you about tonight is, I want to talk to you about how important it is that everyone has heard I want to be the what? Best version of myself. I mean, we talk about it, and we encourage everyone to think about it and try it. But how do you do that? <laughs> how does one actually become the absolute best version of themselves? Well, in, in the book, I argue that to become the best version of yourself, you have to become the world's greatest expert on one subject. Say what? It's that straightforward, and it can't get any more complicated. It's no complication. The secret, the secret that's not a secret, is self-love and self-acceptance. Accepting yourself flaws and all. Accepting yourself. Some of my favorite people are perfectionists, you know? And uh, when I think about perfectionists, I think about an unbelievably brilliant, beautiful woman <laughs> <laughs> by the name of Shalia Harden, which y'all make her feel welcome. <laughs> Shalia will tell you, what was it, don't be perfect, what? Don't be perfect, be progress, progress over perfection. She talks about progress. And I've worked with some people, imagine working with gymnasts. Any gymnasts or former gymnasts in the room? Okay, I could talk about you. <laughs> Imagine working with a gymnast and their mission, what? Is a perfect 10. And then they do a triple dipple back over, flip over, land, pow, throw their hands in the air, smile. And everyone else applauds. Can you imagine trying to work with someone who's struggling with uh, self identity, struggling with uh, in, in the gym, struggling with their coach, struggling in class, struggling in their, with their significant other. And you talk to them and you say, well, you know, what's going on? And all of a sudden you realize that you have to talk to them about how they define themselves, right? So I'll ask you, what's your name? Christian. Christian. I'll ask Christian, well, tell me about your Christian. And Christian will start telling me about himself. And then, but if Christian was a gymnast, the first thing that would come out of his mouth was, my name is Christian, I'm a gymnast. And I, I would say, well, how long have you been a gymnast? And they would say, since I was four years old. How can you not think you're a gymnast <laughs> if you started at four years old? And your whole self-identity, who I am and how I see myself, is measured in performance. What we do when we talk about being perfectly okay with not being perfect, is training perfectionists to surrender to the idea that it's perfectly okay not to be perfect, to be a human being. What I do with these high performance individuals and these pseudo super duper ultra professionals is talk to them like they're regular folks. Treat them like they're a whole person and not a CEO, not a uh, attorney, not a millionaire. Just, but are you still real? And how do you get people to become their best version of themselves? By helping them identify 
how important it is to do self-evaluation, self-assessment, right? To increase their self-awareness. Some of the greatest leaders, some of the greatest performers you've ever met are more aware of who they are than the average person. They know what makes them tick. They know what, who, what pushes their buttons. They even know how to move their buttons. <laughs> you may have to learn how to move. There's a, how many of you, I mean, watch this. How many of you love your family? And all hands go up. How many of you got somebody in your family that gets on your last nerve every time, they, every chance they get, right? And you know it, but nobody else better talk about them because you love them. When we're talking about loving ourselves, we got to love ourselves the way we love the, the person that gets on our last nerve. Because sometimes you get, <laughs> you get on your last nerve, right? So when we talk about this book, I want you to be crystal clear. I am so grateful to Tom Brady for writing the forward. It was very thoughtful. And, 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 and he did it in, in two weeks. He, had, he, he wrote it and sent it in. When you hear about some of the people or read about some of the people in that book, I am eternally grateful to them for allowing me to talk about them and to tell their stories, All right? So I'm going to give you some stuff to think about tonight. Then I might even open up for questions, and then I'll certainly hurt my hand signing some books, all right? Um, when we talk about this whole notion of becoming the world's greatest expert on ourselves, we're talking about pushing and pulling you to increase. Some of you are so good at it, all we're doing is reinforcing and increasing your ability to be self-disciplined, self-motivated, and pursue self-control. That's a game changer. Now, people ask, oh, what's the difference between Tom Brady and Desmond Howard and and everybody else that were on the team. These guys, these gals that I worked with were not only hungry, hungrier than most, driven, fired up, wanted bad. Not only were they hungry, they were humble. You hear what I just said? They were humble. Hungry and humble equals coachable. <laughs> Think about it. It's, you have to surrender your ego to allow someone else to take you to the next level. When we're talking about a Michael Phelps, when we're talking about these superstars, they're just like you and I. To grow, to evolve, to change, to fight for continuous improvement, sometimes I've got to be coachable. I've got to learn something new. I've got to train myself to understand three levels of fitness. And we'll talk about all of that. So just in case this is really good, let's find out if this works. Uh, as you can see, I'm visualizing 70, 80 degrees <laughs> <laughs> as I anticipate the next move. But when you look at this, I want you to think about what I teach. Anyone that'll listen. Anyone that will listen, I'll tell them to learn to give, to practice, train, and rehearse, giving 100%, 100% of the time at everything you do. Can you imagine telling a, an individual who's struggling academically, who's a giant a mountain of a man, and he, all he thinks of is football? I'm a football player. I'm a, Heavyweight wrestler, <laughs> that's what I am. And uh, school, yeah, I'm just here to play football. No, you're not. <laughs> that's, that may be the reason you got here, but if you want to be successful, you, I, imagine telling somebody, if you want to be a better football player, I need you to be a better student. What? <laughs> Try to sell that. I'm trying to convince somebody if they give 100% at everything they do, if you learn to train yourself to push yourself at the stuff you don't even like, what happens when you get to the stuff you love? It's second nature to push. 
to give all that I have. If you hate lifting weights, you hate running, give 100%. Doesn't mean that you'll become a star at it, but you'll be training your mind to tap into that part of your brain that can take you to the next level. If I'm really brutally honest, and I tend to be, uh, one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses is I give it to you straight, no chaser. <laughs> Is it realistic that I could give 100% uh, 100% of the time in everything I do? No. <laughs> and then what, well, how does this work? If my mindset, if my growth mindset, if my default mode, if my automatic always come back to is 100%, 100% of the time, before my off day would be 30%, <laughs> 50% on a good day. But if I'm training myself to give everything I've got, every time, my worst day is going to be better than the average person's best day. All of a sudden, my worst day is 85%. <laughs> Any teachers here? And 85% is what grade? I say what? Solid B. Solid B. You understand? That means I'm above average. That's all we want to train, because I'm not Peter perfect, and I will have an off day. We want our off day to be stronger than the average person's best day. Does that make sense to y'all? That's what I teach. That's what I train. I'm teaching you to, to, to try to get all, I've got people who come in who are struggling academically and tell them, you must believe that you can get a four point. And when you get that 3.5, I want you to pretend you're upset and mad. <laughs> I've had guys who were in academic trouble end up on the dean's list. Now, that's, that's the story that you need to hear. I've had young men and women who were struggling mightily, tap into a part of their brain, part of their self-awareness that taught them to just give everything you got at everything and it becomes second nature. The other thing that might be interesting to you is this whole idea of, oh my God, look at this. Some of the greatest moments, I, let's see, I, uh, I said hello to a couple of people. This, this gentleman, you in the middle, what's your name again? Willie. I don't know Willie, but I can tell you about Willie and everybody in this room. There's been a magic moment in your life, a moment, an adventure that you've been a part of, some of the most fun you've ever had. You were about to crap your pants before you did. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Think back to one of those unbelievable grand adventures, one of the times you had to face something you didn't think you could face. What I teach is that if you can anticipate it, if it's predictable, it's manageable. I need, what I teach high performance individuals is that anxiety and fear is part of being human. We normalize the concept of fear. We anticipate fear. We train ourselves to turn anxiety into excitement. It's a thin line between the two when you think physiologically. What is, how does your body respond when you're anxious? How does your body respond when you're excited? <laughs> Am I right or wrong? So we train our high performance individuals to no longer be overwhelmed because some, some people are like, I'm 45 years old. I, I, I shouldn't be anxious. What do you mean you shouldn't be anxious? <laughs> do you care? Yeah, <laughs> deeply. <laughs> so anxiety has to become a predictable part of life. And instead of being overwhelmed by it, we're inspired. We're excited. Some people think that I don't get anxious about doing what I'm doing right now. I'm so excited and terrified. I love it. <laughs> you follow me? This is excitement, you understand? 
So that's what we teach anyone to listen. So instead of telling you to be fearless, which is a wonderful concept, I wouldn't encourage you. Well, being fearless can be kind of dangerous. <laughs> but if I can teach you that fear is normal, instead of saying be fearless, I say stop being afraid of being afraid. Think about that just for a moment. Stop being afraid. I'm not saying stop being afraid. I'm saying stop being afraid of being afraid. It's part of life. It's who we are. It's how we roll. It's part of the grandest part of our personality. You know, somebody cut you off on the road, you think, well, saber-toothed tiger's after you. <laughs> no. <laughs> we must learn to manage our emotions and stop being afraid of being afraid. My wife found this one. I was fascinated by this. Face everything and rise. That's, think about it. So what else do I teach and what else will you learn in this book? <laughs> control the controllables. Let me tell you the real roots of control the controllables. I used to work uh, in, with alcoholics and addicts. And, uh, you know, I wasn't recovering, but I still had to train and learn and, un and process at a higher level. And I saw this saying called the serenity prayer. Anybody ever heard? Look, you don't have to be an alcoholics and, and add, I, 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 whatever, anonymous. That, for those who haven't heard it, God grant me the serenity the presence of mind, the peace of mind, the stillness. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. <laughs> Whoa! The, the courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Well, I saw this, I'm like 30 years old, I'm saying, they need to teach this in school. <laughs> I mean, no one told me. I, I, it, was a, it opened my whole mind up. You understand? Stop being afraid of being afraid. Have the serenity, the courage, and the wisdom to know I can't control everything. So what I'm going to control is what's in my control. Stop trying to control everybody. You cannot control people you love. Stop it. <laughs> Unless you just want to push them away. We have to train ourselves to overrule that part of our personality that wants to be in control. I am a control freak. Apologies. <laughs> but I had to learn to balance it out with understanding it's foolishness to think I can control everything. It sets me up to fail. It will set you up to fail. So the roots of control, the controllables, comes from me for 40 years. I would have a sign on my door before I walked out to go to work, to go to practice, to do anything. It would say the serenity prayer. And the other thing I had on my door was like, learn to laugh at yourself, and you'll always have something <laughs> to smile about. Think about it. But you have to train yourself. You have to train yourself. So. When you look at control the controllables, how you respond and how you react is up to you. I can't control what just took place, but how I respond, how I react, I have to be deliberate and intentional about being disciplined enough to understand and assertive enough to talk about what I don't like, what I need from you, what I will provide for you. Control the controllables. It takes you to a whole nother level of self-awareness and understanding on how to work on yourself and how to work with other people. <laughs> Commit, improve, and maintain. I don't care what industry you're in, we're always talking about continuous improvement, are we not? But to improve, I have to recommit. Some of you will have to not just commit, recommit. Because some of, some of your lives are working so well. 
that you need to acknowledge how successful you've been as a human being instead of always beating yourself up. Oh, by the way, don't tell anybody I told you all this. Beating yourself up does not work. <laughs> it's ineffective. And some of us are good at it, though. I mean, we perfected it. Beating yourself up does not work. It's ineffective. Now, unless your mission is to be negative, miserable, and depressed. Now, if that's your mission, by all means, continue to beat yourself up. Okay, I might as well add the second piece to that. Worrying does not work. <laughs> it has never changed anything. Am I right or wrong? Think about it. So we are deliberate in trying to train ourselves to think differently, talk to ourselves differently. That's what I teach. Commit, improve, and maintain. But understand we're talking about tiny improvements instead of these humongous, sensational improvements that you dream of. Could you take one step at a time? Could you allow yourself the freedom to change one-tenth of one percent every day? <laughs> Man, in a couple of years, <laughs> your stuff would be right. That's where we're going with this whole piece, and there's a whole chapter on <laughs> CIM, Commit, Improve, and Maintain. Up, oh, become the world's greatest expert on one subject, you. These are some pretty good models. And this spot is waiting for who? Waiting for you. This spot is waiting for you. And that's not talking about being a megastar. It's about being a megastar in your marriage, with your kids, with your parents. It's talking about being a megastar at your job. I remember a job I took one time. I, I just got out of college, and I wanted to create a health club. And I said, I don't know how to create a health club. Perhaps I should go work in one. <laughs> so I went to, oh, I forgot I'm in Michigan. I went to Big Ten International. <laughs> oh, and if, I, I'm sorry, this just came to me. One of our sayings, we can shape your Tonya or ship you to Livonia. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> Whatever you need. Because <laughs> come on, join our, our health club. I swear, that cracks me up. I'm in Livonia. Okay. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but I went and got this job in this health club, and this story's in the book. And she's even talking about giving 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. And I walked in, and I, boy, I was in show enough shape. I mean, I was cut to shreds, right? I walked in, I said, "Hey, I'm coming out. I'd like to be a manager in this uh, gym." And they, they said, "A manager? You walk off the street and be a manager?" And I, no. I say, well, I tell you what, uh, let me start as an instructor. I have, I have 4% body fat. I didn't know I was dying. I mean, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. I, I didn't know you should have a little fat. You know? I had 3 4% body fat. I could train anybody. I can get them together. We don't need any trainers right now. I say, well, what do you need? You know, tell me what you need, and m maybe I can assist you in some way, fashion, or form. They said we need a porter. I said, I'll be your porter. I forgot what a porter was. I, I didn't know the porter was the janitor. <laughs> okay, so now I'm the porter at Vic Tanny International. I had more fun than bubble gum being the porter at Vic Tanny. I was in the basement folding up towels and finding soap. I was cleaning the, the, the scum off the walls. I was cleaning the toilets and the urine. I was polishing the urinal like it was a Rolls Royce. I was whistling while I worked. And people wanted to know, what is wrong with that guy in the basement? <laughs> <laughs> we love him. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm an instructor. Next thing you know, I'm the supervisor over the instructors. In six months, I was assistant manager at Vic Tanny International. Why? Because I gave 100%, 100% of the time. My, I am not a porter. My name is what my name is. Being a porter is what I do, not who I am. Being a, is what you do, not who you are. Do not allow your self-worth and self-esteem to be based on performance, on your grades, on your cash flow. 
how you feel about you has to be internalized. Self-love and self-acceptance changes the game. Stop looking for everyone else to love you. So commit, improve, and maintain over time. There's our kids, our guys, and you. Ah, where do we go? Where do we keep going? Over and over. This is what we'll reinforce over and over in this document. I also talk about self-defeating attitudes and behaviors in the book. To identify what's working and what's not working in my life, I've got to look at some of the characteristics that I have in terms of how I think and how I act that might sabotage my dream. Everybody's got a dream. Everybody has a wish list. I have to identify what might sabotage my own dream that's coming from the inside. Obviously, we go on to the next little and tell you about self-supporting attitudes and behaviors that can set you up to be successful. But when we talk about self-love and self-acceptance, you've got to begin to anticipate, to analyze, and define what does that mean to you. It, it, I'll share what I think, but I need you to say, if I pursued self-love and self-acceptance, what would that really look like? <laughs> Could it change how I'm operating, how I'm thinking? Yes, it could. I shouldn't tell you all this. It gets confusing. You've seen, some of you have been around the world. Some of you have visited uh, Detroit Zoo. Some of you have watched National Geographic. Some of y'all have Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> You've seen creatures from all walks, all over the planet, and some of them have been amazing. But there's only one. One creature that has the ability to decide, I'm not going to be the same today as I was yesterday. That's what the book is talking about. Human beings can transform themselves. They can shift the way they think, the way that they act. They can go to the next level. They, instead of going through it, they want to grow through it. You will be tested in this life. And when we talk about being tested, I got to take you to, I mean, let's finish this piece. Boom. That's who we are. All right. But listen carefully. There are three levels of fitness. This is how we're going to wrap this up. You ready? There are three levels of fitness. Physical mental, and spiritual. Everybody in this room has a clue about physical fitness. If you've never been in shape, you know somebody that knows somebody <laughs> that's been in absolute show enough shape. Am I right or wrong? And if I came from another planet and I didn't have any concept of physical fitness, and I said, well, what is this physical fitness thing you're talking about? You, you of course, say what? Endurance. Stamina, strength, you might even say flexibility, right? But until you say the word recovery, you don't understand fitness. When I'm physically fit, when I'm physically fit, not only can I give 100%, I can rest for a minute and do it again. That's in shape, right? So physical fitness is something we should pursue. You don't have to want to be a, a, a muscle head. You don't have to be, want to be a marathoner. Could you just walk 30 minutes uh, three days a week? <laughs> Could you do something to, to make your heart rate change? Just because you want to be the best at everything, you will have to train your body and not just assume because you're in good shape that you will remain in good shape or because you I look differently than everyone else doesn't mean you can't be in shape. There are people that mm, will be body shamed in better shape than all of you. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? But okay, that opened up the door to what? Mental fitness. <sighs> See, a lot of people we work with and have talked to don't want to talk about mental health. 
uh, trick them. Uh, talk about mental fitness. Because you can practice train to be more mentally fit. But what is mental fitness? You will be tested in this life. Everyone in this room will have trials and tribulations. They will have heartache and heartbreak and loss and grief and disappointment. How fast you recover. <laughs> How fast you recover. It doesn't mean you won't get knocked down or hurt or disappointed. But how fast you come back tells me that you have trained yourself mentally and on terms of self-talk, self-awareness, pursuing, for asking for, um, I know this is hard, asking for help. <laughs> that is a radical concept, right? And, and I'm a professional helper, but my father taught me a simple lesson. I went out in the yard one time, I was eight years old, I said, but can I help your dad? My father looks at me and said, boy, let me tell you something. If you see me in a bear fight, Eight. <laughs> if you see me in a bear fight, don't help me. Help the bear. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> By the 14, what do I know? A man don't ask for help. I know you didn't have the same father, but <laughs> we've got some people in this room who were trained to not ask for help. They fell for the, for the fantasy that it's a sign of weakness. So if you are a major CEO and running things and you're a multi top millionaire every year, would you use consultants? Well, wait a minute, I'm paying you $20 million a year, you need a consultant, why? Because I can't see everything. Because I can't see everything, I'm in the middle of it. Turn counselors into consultants. Stop thinking, well, I don't need anybody in my head. I don't need no therapist. No, you need a consultant. <laughs> and if you don't like them, fire them and hire another one. I just opened the door for some of y'all to get counseling. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you all, hey, that's what we need to do. But when we talk about spiritual fitness, I don't need you to believe what I believe. I'm faith-based and solution-focused. But you better believe in something. Because there's going to be times in your life when your body is going to be broke down and your mind is going to be worn out. You're going to have to tap into something. So what we teach, we open the door for people to understand there's another level of awareness and a belief system that sometimes will be all we have to get through to the next day. Ladies and gentlemen, that's stay sane in the insane world. That's what's in the book. If you're comfortable, I'll open it up and have a couple of people ask questions if they wish. I'd like you to think deep and hard about some questions to ask Mr. Hardy. Not too deep. Never, ever get a chance to pick this brain again. So, um, if anybody has any questions. Sir. Right, but that's a great question. Think about it. The question is, how do you get people, how do you get them to buy in? How do you get them to, to, to increase their motivation? You know, and, and everybody, and people will walk, look, people will walk in and say, I need help, and then fight me all the way. <laughs> right? I mean, I will keep a job, right? <laughs> They'll sign up for help and then fight, because that's our nature. But we use role models and examples. So I'm talking to someone who will never be a, a starting quarterback on a team. But I still have to reference and help them understand what did it take for the person before them to make it. I have to explain to them that uh, uh, 
uh, Tom Brady turned out to be as insecure and frightened as you are. They'll be stunned. People are stunned when they find out that the people they admire and respect were very similar, that they were really human beings. So you have to humanize the superstars and tell them that your self-worth, and that this, I have to tell them the hardest thing I taught Tom Brady, Desmond Howard, Charles Woodson, anybody else, was that football is what you do. It's not who you are. You've got to decide. Imagine this. I'm telling Tom Brady. I'm telling J.J. McCarthy. You've got to decide with or without football. Your life is going to be amazing. Once you make that decision, football works great. If it doesn't, I'll do something else. You sh help them shift. They, they may, I, you may never get them motivated to go into that weight room and put in that kind of work. But you've got to get them, train them to find something to have passion for. Any other questions? Anybody else? Yes, sir. There's an old adage that, that we can't preach or can't uh, teach us old dogs. Look, I love that question. I love that question because guess what? You can teach an old dog. You can teach an old dog any trick they want to learn. You hear what I'm saying? If that old dog loves to roll around in the grass, you say, "Oh, he'll roll." <laughs> you can teach somebody something they're hungry to learn, and eager to learn at any age and at any stage. Before a dot com, most millionaires had failed at least five or six times. <laughs> and they were in their 50s before they had their breakthrough, before dot com. So yes, that's a great question. It is hard to try to teach an old dog something they're not interested in. <laughs> but if they're interested and invested, they'll do whatever it takes because it may be who they are. They love to be trained and love to be, just don't stop moving. Keep moving. watching you. That was a great question. Think about that question. Did everyone hear her? I get accused of being a sports psychologist, but really my model is social work. So I had a guy that believed in me before I believed in myself con me and manipulate me into becoming a social worker? You, you want me to do what? And this guy showed me a world I, I never could imagine. In order to buy into the whole social work model, I had to see the whole person, not just from the neck up. The psychologists are brilliant. Their mission is the neck up. I'm looking at who you're hanging out with. <laughs> I'm asking about what your daddy taught you when you <laughs> went out to the yard. I'm going to find out who you're dating. I want to know what motivates you? I want to know what childhood trauma you had to endure. I want to see you as a whole human being. So once I, 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 so I started training myself to be good at that. But in order to be good at it, I had to do my own work. I had to increase my self-awareness and my ability to read myself to be able to see my own strengths and weaknesses, to increase my ability to see and help you have your breakthrough. So I had to practice, train, and rehearse. I had to surrender my ego. And it was pretty big when I was a young buckaroo. And I had to understand that the more I know, the more I know I don't know. So 
Continuous improvement is what I bought into. I bought into continuous improvement and trying to take the, my, my game to the next level. And my game was working with people. And I loved it. I found something that I would do for free and figure out how to get paid for it. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Well, that's a great question. Think about it. One of the ways we can do it is stop wanting them to learn how we would do it and for you to learn how they would do it. <laughs> You've got to be able to understand generation. One of the things I hate most about some of our generational training, because we're talking about uh, cross-cultural communication. Culture is more than race <laughs> and sex. It includes generation. How to work cross-generational will make you one of the most amazing coaches in the world. Instead of just wanting, well, I called you, and I want to answer the phone. <laughs> I'm going to call you, I'm going to email you, and I'm going to text you if I'm serious. <laughs> because one of them might work for you. <laughs> You've got to teach them to be universal in their understanding that everyone doesn't see the world the way you see it, but you've got to practice what you preach. You've got to make sure that you talk to your audience in a language they understand. You have to study them. And study, I, I, I saw a, a, a rancher who raises sh sheep and cattle on TikTok. <laughs> rancher on TikTok? He's on TikTok trying to get people outside of his community and outside of his world understanding his world. So you've got to find out what they're excited about. I used to have Desmond Howard come and tell me t what lyrics are, are, are working in, in the community right now in, in these rap songs. I'm not going to listen to this crap. You come and school me. Tell me what. I'm not. So I, have, I would have my spies, <laughs> my cultural spies, come and tell me, this is what people are listening to. This is what's hot. And he'd give me the lyrics that, that might work for me because that was my guy. You will always have somebody on the team who's more mature than everybody else. You better bond with them. There'll be informal leaders on the team in your business, in your company, in your corporation. Don't, don't just look at the assistant coaches and the captains. Look at, find out who the informal leaders are on your team. And study them. Watch them. <laughs> and use them to be someone that's showing you what's going to work, what might not work. You understand? I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Okay. One more. Um, so in uh, thinking about your concept 100%, 100% of the time, how can we avoid burnout? Ooh, by giving 100% at relaxation. <laughs> am, am, am I serious? You know I'm serious. If you're going to have fun, have fun. If you're going to have a relationship, you, 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 you can't, you'll, you'll make appointments. And you'll do anything not to break that appointment. Am I, am I right or wrong? But when you make an appointment to yourself or to your significant other, eh, <laughs> I, 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 well, maybe I can move this. Don't move it. Make sense? If, you're going, I, if you know how to have, some of y'all need to learn how to have fun. Again, <laughs> ain't talking about the fun you used to have. The things we used to do, we don't do them no more. <laughs> but there must be a new way of training yourself to relax. I mean, we've got a, a, a national championship quarterback who's meditating. You know, football. He said, talking about yoga position and my chakras, <laughs> my center of my being. He's serious. Because he wanted to be the best. And whatever it would take for him to be the best is what he would study. 
So being able to relax in stress, intense moments, give 100% at learning how to relax. Some of us have to train. We talk about it, but we don't do it. Thank you for your question. <laughs> All right. Yes. On a mental piece, can you expand on how to, again, uh, as you were talking about, shift or change your mental being to become the best you version of you? I think you talked about a SWOT analysis on yourself. It's my ace. <laughs> so Shalia is asking to go further in terms of mental fitness and recovery. All right. In order to really take it to the next level, what we introduce to people is, again, how to become the world's greatest expert on yourself. She opened up the door for me to talk to you about what else is in the book, and that is SWAT yourself. What? S-W-O-T. Some of you uh, business uh, executives and MBAs, and some of you uh, organizational development gurus have taught SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is where you go get a sheet and you've got mm, mm, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to success of this organization. What are the strengths of our organization? What are the weaknesses or challenges? Scott analysis. <laughs> what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to this organization's success? I have the audacity to do it with human beings. I say, I want you to look at yourself. I want you to identify your strengths, your weaknesses. That means stop being afraid of looking at what's not working. The hardest thing for some people to do is look at their own weaknesses. Some, thing, some folks, the hardest thing to do is for them, they can identify all their weaknesses and none of their strengths. <laughs> but asking you to look at your own strengths and weaknesses, to look at what opportunities are present internally and externally, and what are the threats internal and external to reaching your full potential. That SWOT analysis, that SWOT analysis opens up the door, is that still recording? Right. Opens up the door for you to understand mental fitness, self-evaluation, Self-assessment is is and gives you an advantage over all your competition. Oh, listen to me. If you want to compete, know yourself better than everybody else. If you need to know your weaknesses better than anyone, and then come up with a formula to eliminate your weaknesses or transform them so that they are not a threat to your success. That makes sense. Recovery time is the name of the game. Recover. How fast do you recover from adversity and heartache and disappointment? It may be a long time, but all you want to do is learn how to shorten your recovery time. You will still have to recover, but could we <laughs> reduce how long it takes for me to bounce back? How'd I do? Thank you, Ken. <laughs>